There are five major strategies for treating lung cancer. Physically removing the lung cancer from the patient's body by surgical resection. Using high energy external beam x-ray radiation to kill or slow the growth of lung cancer cells. Infusing chemicals into the patient's bloodstream to kill fast growing cells such as cancer. Hobbling or killing cancer cells by targeting cancer specific genetic changes. And amplifying the patient's own immune system to attack the lung cancer. We're going to focus on two strategies that have been the backbone of lung cancer treatment for many decades, surgical resection and radiation therapy. We'll review the most common surgical procedures and radiotherapy techniques for lung cancer. And for each one, we'll tackle six issues. What happens? In what situations is the treatment used? How is it performed? What a normal post-procedure course is like? What you should expect to see on medical imaging after treatment? And finally, post-procedure complications that could occur and how they might appear on medical imaging. Before we start, we'll spend a minute or two to get everyone on the same page with regards to surgical lung resection in general. The goal of surgical lung resection is to give a patient their best chance at a cure by attempting to completely remove lung cancer from the body. The amount of lung cancer that needs to be resected depends on a couple factors, such as how big the lung cancer is, how much tissue around the cancer needs to also be resected in order to be confident nothing's been left behind, and where the lung cancer is located. The same cancer in this right upper lobe, if situated across a fissure, for example, may require two lobes to be resected instead of just one lobe. These considerations are balanced by the need to preserve as much healthy lung in the patient's body as possible. Folks with lung cancer often may have substantial emphysema and require as much functional lung tissue for gas exchange as possible. There are a couple of different types of lung cancer resection surgery. In a pneumonectomy, the entire lung is removed. Resecting an entire lung is sort of like plucking a tomato off a stem. A lung is encased by an airtight membrane called the visceral pleura and attached to the rest of the body by a single airway, a single pulmonary artery, and only two or three pulmonary veins. In a lobectomy, a single lobe of a lung is removed. Resecting a lobe is also sort of like plucking a tomato off a stem. Each lung lobe is encased by its own visceral pleural membrane independent of the other lobes of that same lung. And each lobe is connected to the rest of the body by a single airway, a single pulmonary artery, and a single pulmonary vein. In sublobar resections, part of a single lobe is removed. Sublobar resections where a segment of a lobe is removed along an anatomic boundary, uh, usually the boundary of the segment of that lobe are called segmentectomies. Resecting a segment is different than resecting a lobe or an entire lung, as it's not like plucking a tomato off a stem. Although a segment is supplied by only one airway and one pulmonary artery, it may be drained by many small pulmonary veins, and it's not encased within a visceral pleural envelope independent from the other segments of that lobe. So if you were to resect a segment with a scalpel, the raw open parenchymal surface of the remaining lung lobe you'd leave behind would create a massive air leak situation from the millions of alveoli you disrupted when making your incision and pretty bad bleeding from the innumerable tiny pulmonary veins you've transected. Sublobar resections where a small portion of a lobe is removed along a non-anatomic boundary are referred to as wedge resections. Wedge resections like segmentectomies are different than resecting a lobe or a entire lung and are not like picking a tomato off a stem. The portion of lung removed during a wedge resection may be supplied by many small airways, many small pulmonary arteries, many small pulmonary veins, and is not encased within a visceral pleural envelope independent from the rest of the lobe. We often see staple lines in 
a lung after a recession. What's the story with that? Well, with pneumonectomies and lobectomies, the basic mechanics of taking a hunk of lung tissue out is conceptually straightforward, requiring the ligation and dissection of only a few tubes, a pulmonary artery, a pulmonary vein, and an airway. If you've done that, the lung tissue can be safely removed with no bleeding or air leak from the bronchovascular stump that remains in the body. With sublobar resections, however, you'd need to dissect and ligate thousands and thousands of tiny airways and vessels if you were to make a cut, which is unfeasible. As a consequence, sublobar resections require a different solution than ligating and dissecting a few tubes. With sublobar resections, a tool is used that lays down two airtight and fluid type rows of staples. Now, if you make a cut between these parallel staple lines, a sublobar portion of lung can be safely removed since you have an air, water, and blood type seal near the margin of the lobe you leave behind in the patient's body. A staple line will be visible along the margin of the portion of the lobe you leave behind in the patient, which is visible on chest CT and many chest x-rays. Now, let's begin. Pneumonectomies. In a pneumonectomy, the right or left pulmonary artery central pulmonary veins, and mainstem bronchus are transected, and the entire lung is removed, in addition to the visceral pleural membrane along the surface of that lung. We refer to this as an intrapleural pneumonectomy. Some nearby lymph nodes may also be removed, though the number may vary. In cases where the lung cancer invades the mediastinum, the parietal pleura lining the interior of the rib cage may also be removed, in addition to the lung and visceral pleura, resulting in an extra pleural pneumonectomy. In situations where the lung cancer involves the hemidiaphragm, the hemidiaphragm may also be removed and replaced by a surgical mesh that's visible on CT. Pneumonectomies are usually reserved for lung cancer cases where attempting a lobectomy alone may not achieve clean margins. These are often situations when a lung cancer extends across a fissure or involves the main stem bronchus. Pneumonectomies may, on rare occasions, be performed for reasons other than lung cancer, such as in severe cases of tuberculosis or fungal infection, or cases of severe traumatic lung damage. Pneumonectomies are usually performed via a postural lateral approach where access to the lung is made via an oblique incision along the postural lateral chest wall. The ribs may be retracted to create a wider window, and sometimes an osteotomy of a rib is used to help create an even wider window. In a pneumonectomy, the main stem bronchial, pulmonary arterial, and pulmonary venous connections between the lung and the rest of the body are severed, and the lung removed, and the chest wall closed. Removing an entire lung results in an empty rib cage on one side, which we refer to as a post-pneumonectomy space. While the post-pneumonectomy space is initially completely air-filled after surgery, fluid will gradually accumulate within this space over time during a normal post-pneumonectomy course, replacing about half of the air by post-op day five and 80 to 90% of the air by two weeks' time. Let's review the imaging findings you should expect to see on chest x-rays during a typical post-pneumonectomy course. On the patient's first chest x-ray after surgery on post-op day zero, the post-pneumonectomy space will be completely filled with air and appear entirely lucent, like on this patient's left side on this chest x-ray. You'll probably also see some new surgical clips near the hilum from the surgery as well. On post-op day one, the post-pneumonectomy space will be mostly air-filled, but also now contain a small to small to medium amount of fluid. If there's air under the hemidiaphragm, like the stomach gas present in this patient's image, you'll also be able to see that the hemidiaphragm on the side of the pneumonectomy is now mildly elevated. On chest x-rays over the next two weeks, you'll still see air in the post-pneumonectomy space, but the relative amount of fluid will progress 
will progressively increase over time. If your patient is well enough to get an upright rather than a supine chest x-ray, you'll see a sharp air fluid level manifest in the post-pneumonectomy space. You'll see mild elevation of the hemidiaphragm as before, but you'll also begin seeing mild mediastinal and tracheal shift towards the side of the pneumonectomy now as well. On chest x-rays over the next six months, the post-pneumonectomy space will become completely filled with fluid and now appear homogeneously opaque. As the amount of hemidiaphragm elevation and mediastinal shift become even more pronounced, the contralateral lung will appear hyperinflated compared to before the surgery, and you may also get a sense that the rib cage on the side of the pneumonectomy has slightly contracted, resulting in crowding of the ribs on that side. The typical long-term appearance six months out or later after a pneumonectomy will continue to demonstrate many of these imaging features. The amount of contralateral lung inflation will appear even greater, and the soft tissue rind along the margins of the post-pneumonectomy space will probably now be visible along the inner surface of the ribcage on chest CT images. Let's look at a few normal imaging examples of patients who are far out from their pneumonectomy. We can tell that this patient has had a left pneumonectomy. The left hemithorax is completely and homogeneously opacified, and there's crowding of the left ribs if you compare the width of the intercostal spaces between the left side and the right side. The trachea and mediastinum have shifted into the left chest. Since the heart has shifted entirely leftward and no lucent lung abuts heart anymore, the cardiac silhouette is no longer resolvable on this frontal chest x-ray. We get a much clearer view of the thoracic spine than usual as well, since the mediastinum and heart are no longer sitting over the spine on a frontal chest x-ray. A coronal chest CT of this patient shows all of the same findings plus elevation of the left hemidiaphragm. Axial CT images give us a nice look at how much the mediastinum and heart shift into the left chest, in addition to how the left ribs appear more crowded together than on the right side. If we look at the post-pneumonectomy space itself, we'll see a uniform soft tissue rind along its margins. The hyperinflation of the contralateral lung can be pretty apparent on lung windows. Notice how much right lung now lives left of midline. Compared to other thoracic surgeries, complication rates following a pneumonectomy are higher. We tend to keep a pretty close eye on patients after a pneumonectomy, and frequent serial chest x-ray imaging is common in the immediate post-op period. Mortality rates after pneumonectomy may be around 5% to slightly north of 5%. Early complications we're on the lookout for after a pneumonectomy include post-op bleeding in the mediastinum from a vessel injury during surgery. We may suspect this if we see abnormal mediastinal widening on a patient's post-op chest x-rays. On chest CT, mediastinal bleeding may manifest as high attenuation material or fluid infiltrating the mediastinal fat. We're also looking out for post-op bleeding into the post-pneumonectomy space too. Normal fluid accumulation in the post-pneumonectomy space should occur over a course of days to weeks. However, if we notice a much more rapid fluid increase in the post-pneumonectomy space on serial chest x-rays, we need to consider the possibility that the fluid we're seeing may be blood from a bleed. On chest CT, blood in the post-pneumonectomy space in the setting of a bleed may appear as non-uniform attenuation fluid with high attenuation regions that correspond to fresh blood. Pneumonia is a common post-pneumonectomy complication, particularly if the patient has received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that is, chemotherapy before their surgery, and is immunosuppressed. Pneumonia will usually appear as fluffy focal or multifocal consolidation in the remaining lung with or without ground glass opacities on chest CT. Post-pneumonectomy pulmonary edema is another early complication we fear. All of the incidence is under 5%, it tends to be associated with a high mortality rate. Consolidation with or without ground glass passes are the typical imaging feature, though usually in a diffuse rather than focal or multifocal distribution in the remaining contralateral lung. Bronchopleural fistulas are an early complication following pneumonectomy that can happen in the setting of a bronchial stump that dehist due to ischemia or 
a bronchial stump that was not satisfactorily closed off at the time of surgery. Incidence rates tend to be in the single digit percents, though mortality rates can be high. We suspect a bronchial pleural fistula may be present when serial chest x-rays show that the post pneumonectomy space fails to completely fill with fluid over time, or if the amount of fluid in the space decreases or the amount of air increases in the post pneumonectomy space over time. In a post pneumonectomy space that was completely fluid filled, any appearance of new air in that space will also require an investigation for the source of the air and for a bronchopleural fistula. Pleural empyemas are another early complication after pneumonectomy and most often occur in the setting of a bronchopleural fistula. In cases without a bronchopleural fistula, intraoperative contamination tends to be the leading culprit. The incidence of pleural empyemas is under 5%, though mortality rates can be high when they occur. We'll suspect a pleural empyema if serial chest x-rays show rapid fluid accumulation in the post-pneumonectomy space or hyperdistension of a completely opacified post-pneumonectomy space with contralateral shift away from the side of the pneumonectomy. Chest CT imaging features of a pleural empyema include a convex rather than concave mediastinal border on the side of the pneumonectomy or other direct features such as irregular pleural thickening and enhancement, a split pleura sign, air fluid levels in the post pneumonectomy space, or overt extension of abnormal fluid into the chest wall. Chylothoraces resulting from lymphatic fluid leaking into the post pneumonectomy space from an injured thoracic duct or other lymphatic vessel may be recognized as far out as 10 days post pneumonectomy. On chest x-ray, we can't distinguish a chylothorax from other causes of pleural fluid accumulation. However, on chest CTs, we sometimes can. Chylothoraces that happen to be particularly lipid-rich can manifest on CT as a pleural fluid accumulation with attenuation much lower than water. There are three major late complications in patients who've had a pneumonectomy. One late complication is tumor recurrence. The most common site of local tumor recurrence is the, bron the bronchial stump, and therefore tumor recurrence can be very tough to recognize on chest x-ray since the entire hemithorax is normally opacified post pneumonectomy and the left hilar and mediastinal margins obscured. While increased fluid within the post pneumonectomy space and contralateral mediastinal shift away from the side of the pneumonectomy might be visible on chest x-ray in the setting of tumor currents, this is typically a pretty late stage finding. We have a much better chance of catching recurrent tumor earlier on chest CTs. Things we would look for on a chest CT include new soft tissue mass near the bronchial stump, increased pleural soft tissue thickening along the margins of the post pneumonectomy space, and increased mediastinal lymphadenopathy. For each of these findings, intravenous contrast is very helpful and can meaningfully improve our sensitivity and specificity when interpreting a pneumonectomy patient's chest CT. A late onset bronchial pleural fistula resulting from breakdown of the bronchial stump is another late complication that could occur after pneumonectomy. Breakdown of the bronchial stump is more likely to occur in patients who've received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, patients who've had a post-op course complicated by infection, and patients who have developed recurrent tumor at the stump. Imaging features that would prompt us to suspect a late onset bronchial pleural fistula would include the sudden appearance of air in a post pneumonectomy space that was previously completely opacified by fluid or by contralateral mediastinal shift away from the side of the pneumonectomy. Finally, post pneumonectomy syndrome is a, another late complication we're on the lookout for in patients who've had a pneumonectomy. We tend to encounter post pneumonectomy syndrome in patients who've had a right sided pneumonectomy. In these folks, the remaining left lung can become quite hyperinflated, and if the mediastinum shifts rightward by a large enough amount, the left main stem bronchus can become quite stretched and narrowed, compromising airflow. 
On chest CT, we may observe abnormal narrowing of the left main stem bronchus, and these patients will often present with symptoms such as dyspnea, wheezing, or recurrent pneumonia. Now, let's move on to lobectomies. In a lobectomy, the lobar pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, and bronchus are transected, and a lobe of the lung with its enveloping visceral pleural membrane is removed. Some nearby lymph nodes may also be removed. In situations when the fissures separating the individual lobes of a lung are incomplete, a cut through lung parenchyma may be required to release the lobe and a staple line will have been laid down to prevent air leak. After a lobe is removed, the remaining lobes in the same side of the chest usually promptly hyperinflate and begin to fill the hemithorax. Most lobectomies are performed for primary lung cancer, but lobectomies are sometimes performed for reasons other than lung cancer, such as severe cases of TB, fungal infection, bronchiectasis, or severe lung damage after trauma. From a mechanical perspective, lobectomies are conceptually similar to pneumonectomies. Two approaches can be used for a lobectomy. Open thoracotomy or video-assisted thoracotomy, or VATS, which is a less invasive um, approach. Lobectomies can be performed via an oblique incision along the postural lateral chest wall and retraction of the ribs to permit access to the lung in the setting of an, op uh, of an open uh, thoracotomy. Um, lobectomies can also be performed via VATS, which involves three small incisions in the chest wall to create ports through which a video camera, ring clamp, and other tool are introduced. Lobectomies performed via VATS result in lower morbidity than open thoracotomy. Complication rates are similar to open thoracotomy approach, though there's some debate whether the bleeding complication rates may be slightly higher with VATS approaches or not. The cost of a lobectomy via VATS or via open thoracotomy are pretty similar. With a lobectomy, regardless of approach, an empty post pneumonectomy space isn't created after surgery since one or two lobes will remain in the hemithorax after resection. The remaining lobes will usually hyperinflate to fill some of the hemithorax almost immediately after surgery. Besides surgical clips and the occasional staple line, chest x-ray findings we typically expect to see on post-op day one after lobectomy include an ipsilateral pneumothorax, pleural effusion, and mild ipsilateral lung volume reduction since the lung is smaller now that a lobe has been removed. It's also common to see bibasal lung opacities due to atelectasis, often because the patient is sedated and not taking deep breaths, in addition to focal patchy opacities in the ipsilateral lung from lung contusions um, that might have been caused by handling of the lung during surgery, or atelectasis due to architectural distortion post lobectomy. On post-op days two through seven, an ipsilateral pneumothorax may still be present, but is usually small and shrinking. You may see some subcutaneous emphysema or pneumomediastinum during this time, but these should also be improving and not getting worse. Focal patchy lung opacities may still be present due to atelectasis of one cause or another, but probably no longer from lung contusions since contusions should have resolved after the first 24 to 48 hours. If a chest CT happens to get done during post-op days two through seven after a lobectomy, expect to see the same findings as on chest X-ray, in addition to the obvious anatomic features of a lobectomy, um, namely absence of a lobe and a blind ending bronchial stump where the resected lobar bronchus would have been. During week, the, during week two um, post-lobectomy, any pneumothorax, subcutaneous emphysema, and pneumomediastinum have usually resolved. But other findings, such as ipsilateral pleural fusion, mild ipsilateral lung volume reduction, and atelectasis in the ipsilateral lung may still be present. If a patient's post-lobectomy course has been going smoothly, we usually won't see many serial chest x-rays past the two-week mark, and the next chest x-ray will probably be a lot further down the road time-wise. On chronic post-lobectomy chest x-rays, typical imaging findings uh, may include mild ipsilateral lung volume reduction with mild hemidiaphragm elevation, and mediastinal shift towards the side of the lobectomy. Mild pleural thickening, some architectural distortion within the lung that was operated on, and of course, direct evidence of a lobe resection on chest CT images. Let's look at a few normal images of patients far out from their lobectomies. In this patient who's had a right upper lobectomy, the lung volumes are asymmetric since the right lung is smaller than the left lung. The right hemidiaphragm is elevated, 
and the trachea is displaced rightward. A conspicuous right apical pleural cap is present, which corresponds to extra pleural fat that's been pulled inwards by an upper right lung that takes up much less space than it used to. This patient had a right lower lobectomy. The right lung is decreased in volume and the right hemidiaphragm elevated. This patient has had a right middle lobectomy. Right middle lobes are the smallest of all five lung lobes and no over chest x-ray findings um, are apparent on this x-ray, probably because the amount of lung removed was relatively small. In this CT of a patient post-right lower lobectomy, there's elevation of the right hemidiaphragm and mild rightward mediastinal shift, as demonstrated by a trachea that's around two to three centimeters right of midline. In this patient, um, CT of a patient post-right upper lobectomy, uh, both mild rightward mediastinal shift and mild posterior right pleural thickening are present. In this CT of a patient post-right lower lobectomy, notice how the lung fissure is focally distorted while in this CT of a patient post-right middle lobectomy, we see a blind-ending right middle lobe bronchus stump branching anteriorly from the bifurcation of the bronchus intermedius in addition to a few surgical clips nearby. Here's an example of a right lower lobe bronchus stump and staple line post-right lower lobectomy. And an example of staple lines in the anterior right lung in a patient post-right middle lobectomy. Mortality rates post lobectomy are lower than after a pneumonectomy. Complications, if they occur, tend to happen in the first month after the lobectomy. Complications we're on the lookout for include post-op bleeding in the mediastinum from a vessel injury during surgery. We may suspect this if we see abnormal mediastinal widening on a patient's post-op chest x-rays. And on chest CT, mediastinal bleeding uh, may manifest as high attenuation material or fluid infiltrating the mediastinal fat. We're also looking out for post-op bleeding into the ipsilateral pleural space. If we see a rapid increase in pleural fluid on serial chest x-rays, especially one that ends up filling the entire hemithorax, we need to investigate if that fluid we're seeing may be blood from a bleed. On chest CT, hemothorax in the setting of bleed may appear as non-uniform attenuation pleural fluid accumulation with high attenuation components corresponding to pockets of fresh blood. A persistent air leak is another possible early complication post lobectomy, which we begin to worry about if we see a persistent ipsilateral pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, or subcutaneous emphysema more than a week out from surgery. Air leaks tend to be more common in lobectomies performed in patients with incomplete fissures. Air leaks are usually transient, though prolonged cases may require drainage. Bronchopleural fistulas are a severe complication following a lobectomy, that can occur if there was a problem with the closure of the bronchial stump at the time of surgery, and positive pressure mechanical ventilation is also a known risk factor. We suspect a bronchopleural uh, fistula may be present when serial chest x-rays show a worsening hydronumothorax. Bronchopleural fistulas are most often diagnosed around 8 to 12 days following a lobectomy when they occur. Pleural empyemas are a severe complication after lobectomy, and most often occur in the setting of a bronchopleural fistula. Intraoperative contamination is the leading cause in cases without a bronchopleural fistula. We suspect a pleural edema, a uh, pleural empyema, if serial chest x-rays show rapid ipsilateral pleural fluid accumulation with or without contramediastinal shift away from the side of the lobectomy. Chest CT imaging features of a pleural empyema include pronounced pleural thickening with enhancement, and overt extension of pleural fluid accumulation into the chest wall. Pneumonia is a common post-lobectomy complication, particularly in patients who've received neoadjuvant chemotherapy before surgery and are immunosuppressed. Pneumonias will usually appear as fluffy focal or multifocal consolidation with I within either lung with or without ground glass opacities on chest CT. Lung herniations are another complication that can occasionally occur if a chest wall defect created during surgery to access the lung persists through which a portion of lung protrudes. Late complications post lobectomy are few uh, in type um, and predominantly consist of lung herniations and tumor recurrence. A common site for local tumor recurrence in post lobectomy patients is the bronchial stump. However, tumor recurrence can occur in other locations too, such as in the pleural space, where recurrent tumor could present as increased pleural soft tissue thickening on CT or 
as an increasing pleural effusion. Tumor recurrence can also present as a new nodule anywhere in the patient's remaining lung tissue or as growing mediastinal lymph nodes on chest CT. Now let's move on to sublobar lung resections, such as a segmentectomy or wedge resection. Compared to pneumonectomies and lobectomies, sublobar lung resections are better tolerated by patients with compromised lung function. When it comes to lung cancer surgery, sublobar resections tend to be reserved for low-grade lung cancers, as sublobar resections may not provide much of a survival benefit for many higher-grade lung cancers. On occasion, however, we do witness situations where a wedge resection is performed for a metastasis to the lung, a metastectomy, if you will, in patients with a malignancy that appears to have only metastasized to the lung and nowhere else. Besides cancer surgery, sublobar lung resections may be used to resect bully or regions of emphysematous lung to improve respiratory function in patients with severe COPD, um, for chronic infections like uh, mycetomas, and in cases of severe lung damage after trauma. Like lobectomy, sublobar lung resections can be approached by either open thoracotomy or VATS. On post-op day one after, of a typical um, post-op course after sublobar lung resection, the remaining lung on the side of the wedge resection has rapidly hyperinflated to fill much of the hemithorax, though a pneumothorax will probably still be visible along with a small ipsilateral pleural effusion. Expect to see bibasilar lung opacities due to atelectasis, perhaps because the patient's sedated and not taking deep breaths yet. And expect to see focal patchy opacities in the ipsilateral lung from lung contusions caused by handling of the lung during surgery or atelectasis near the staple line from the rudge resection. On post-op days two through seven after a segmentectomy or wedge resection, subcutaneous emphysema and pneumomediastinum may be visible and a pneumothorax may still be present, but should be improving. Focal patchy lung opacities may still be present due to atelectasis of one cause or another, but probably no longer from lung contusions since contusions should have resolved after the first day or two. During the second week of a normal post-op course after a segmentectomy or wedge resection, any pneumothorax, subcutaneous emphysema, um, or pneumomediastinum will have resolved. Typical long-term imaging features uh, we see um, post-wedge resection include, post, um, uh, include uh, focal architectural distortion within the lung that's undergone sublobar resection, and of course the staple line. Mild pleural thickening may or may not be present um, as well. Let's look at a few normal images of patients who are far out from a sublobar lung resection. In this patient who's had a sublobar left lung resection, we see a faint staple line, focal architectural distortion, and a curvilinear cicatricial atelectatic band in the upper and mid left lung. The left lung appears normal in size. On chest CT, the airway and pulmonary vessels are intact at the lobar level since the resection has been of a sublobar region rather than an entire lobe. Here's a very typical appearance of a lung on CT after a left upper lobe wedge resection. A thin, dense staple line can be observed on consecutive CT images along the posterior margin of this left upper lobe, in addition to mild local architectural distortion as evidenced by slight tethering of the major fissure near the staple line and a thin associated cicatricial atelectatic band. And here's a sagittal perspective of this same lung. Mortality rates after sublobar lung resections are lower than after pneumonectomies and lobectomies. Complications, if they occur, will usually happen in the first month after surgery. Possible complications after a segmentectomy or wedge resection uh, include post-op bleeding into the ipsilateral pleural space from lung vessel injury during surgery. It's important to investigate the possibility of a hemothorax caused by blood accumulating in the pleural space whenever we observe a rapid increase in pleural fluid on serial chest x-rays, especially when the pleural fluid fills the entire hemithorax. In a supine position like a patient like this one, large pleural fluid accumulations will often present as a homogeneous unilateral opacity throughout one side of the chest with or without a gradient superiorly. On chest CT, a hemothorax in the setting of a bleed may appear as a non-uniform attenuation pleural fluid accumulation uh, possible with high attenuation components corresponding to sites of fresh blood accumulation. A persistent air leak is another complication following a segmentectomy or wedge resection. 
the presence of a persistent ipsilateral pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, or subcutaneous emphysema more than a week out from surgery usually requires us to investigate the possibility of an ear leak. Ear leaks are usually transient, though prolonged cases may require drainage by the surgery or interventional radiology services. Pleural empyemas are an, are an uncommon but severe complication after a sigmatectomy or wedge resection that could arise from intraoperative contamination. The possibility of pleural empyema should be investigated if serial chest x-rays show rapid ipsilateral pleural fluid accumulation with or without contralateral mediastinal shift away from the side of the pneumonectomy of the, uh, sorry, of the uh, wedge resection or segmentectomy. Chest CT images um, imaging features of a pleural empyema uh, would include pronounced pleural thickening with enhancement and overt extension of pleural fluid accumulation into the chest wall. Lung herniations are another complication that can occasionally occur when a chest wall defect created during surgery to access the lung persists, through which a portion of lung protrudes. Late complications post segmentectomy and wedge resection predominantly consist of lung herniations and tumor recurrence. A common site for local tumor recurrence in patients who've had a segmentectomy or wedge resection is along the staple line. However, tumor recurrence can occur in the pleural space where a recurrent tumor could present as increased pleural soft tissue thickening on CT or as an increasing pleural effusion. Tumor recurrence in the chest could also present as a new nodule anywhere in the patient's remaining lung tissue or as enlarging mediastinal lymph nodes on chest CT. That covers the gamut of surgical lung resection options. Let's move on to discuss radiation therapy. With radiation therapy, high energy external x-ray beams are used to either kill lung cancer cells or keep them from growing. Radiation therapy is used in a variety of lung cancer scenarios. Radiation therapy may be administered before or after surgical lung resection in patients with non-small cell lung cancers or to shrink non-operative non-small cell lung cancers too. A scenario we also frequently see is for um, the treatment of small peripheral minimally invasive lung adenocarcinomas in both patients who are and are not surgical candidates. In limited stage small cell lung cancers, radiation therapy may be done concurrently or after chemotherapy. Radiation therapy may sometimes be done after chemotherapy in some extensive small cell lung cancer cases as well. The external x-ray beams used for radiation therapy are much more powerful than the x-ray beams we use for diagnostic imaging and can deliver a substantial amount of ionizing radiation into lung cancer cells, killing them or slowing their growth by damaging their DNA. Some amount of collateral damage may occur with radiation therapy since it's difficult to avoid reading a bit of normal surrounding lung tissue um, if we're trying to treat the entire lung cancer. Although normal lung, um, cancer, although normal lung cells tend to be a little better at repairing DNA damage than lung cancer cells, they're not invincible. Traditionally, radiation therapy to a lung cancer was performed by directing two parallel rectangular high-energy x-ray beams at a lung cancer in opposed orientation, posteroanteriorly and anteroposteriorly. However, this method of radiotherapy, conventional 2D radiation therapy, delivers a large amount of ionizing radiation to large regions of normal lung tissue and is therefore no longer used. Techniques that are currently used include stereotactic body radiation therapy, or SBRT, which is also known as stereotactic ablative radiotherapy, or SABR. With SBRT, multiple low-energy X-ray beams are shaped and converge on the lung cancer from different angles three-dimensionally. With SBRT, damage to normal tissues can be substantially reduced while still delivering sufficient ionizing radiation to treat a lung cancer. A chest CT is required to define a three-dimensional target volume, and computers map the required X-ray beam trajectories needed. The radiation dose is fractionated and delivered as three to five treatments over a one to two week period. IMRT, or Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy, uses multiple X-ray beams with different intensities to deliver the highest dose to the tumor while potentially exposing surrounding healthy tissue to less radiation than SBRT. IMRT often involves a longer course of treatment compared to other forms of radiation therapy since the delivery of the radiation is more complex and requires more time. 
IMRT also requires specialized equipment and personnel and is generally more expensive than SBRT. When evaluating patients who have received radiation therapy to the lung, I customarily approach their post-treatment course in two blocks, months 1 through 6 and months 7 through 24, after completion of radiation therapy. In a typical post-treatment course, we may see the lung cancer shrink throughout the first two years, while we'll typically see some radiation pneumonitis in the normal lungs surrounding a lung cancer during the first six months, followed by radiation fibrosis in the surrounding normal lung during the post-treatment months 7 through 24. During the first six months after completing radiotherapy, local capillary leak edema and inflammation may occur in the normal lungs surrounding a lung cancer arising from injuries sustained by the small vessels and capillaries during radiation therapy. We refer to this as radiation pneumonitis, and it's asymptomatic in the vast majority of patients, and usually doesn't occur until at least a month or so after radiation therapy is completed. In the small number of patients who are symptomatic, symptoms such as shortness of breath, cough, chest discomfort, and low-grade fever are usually self-limited and resolve after a few weeks. Radiation pneumonitis appears on imaging as consolidative and or ground glass lung opacities in the vicinity of a treated lung cancer. The lung opacities may appear homogeneous or heterogeneous, and since the cause was entirely external, the lung opacities may not conform to natural anatomic boundaries like lung fissures, unlike in disorders like, say, pneumonia. Concurrent ipsilateral pleural effusion or atelectasis may be present in some patients, but the lung findings of radiation pneumonitis usually should completely resolve by six months post-treatment. Here's a chest CT of radiation pneumonitis in the left lung following radiation therapy to a central lung cancer. The lung opacity corresponding to radiation pneumonitis in this patient is homogeneous and ground glass in character. Also notice that the lateral margin of the ground glass opacity conforms to no natural anatomic boundary. In this patient with radiation pneumonitis in the left lung, the radiation pneumonitis appears heterogeneous and is composed of a combination of consolidation and ground glass opacities. In months 7 through 24 after completing radiotherapy, radiation fibrosis may develop in the normal lungs surrounding a treated lung cancer. The chronic fibrosis that, usually, that appears is usually asymptomatic and typically stabilizes in its appearance by two years after the completion of radiation therapy. The chronic fibrosis that corresponds to radiation fibrosis will usually appear as a well-defined region of lung that is completely opaque, partially retracted, and associated with local architectural distortion that exhibits features of both fibrosis and consolidation. The shape of this fibroconsolidative opacity can be regional, mass-like, or linear. In patients with radiation fibrosis, pleural thickening or effusions can also occur, and the lung retraction um, and lung retraction uh, may also result in um, some mediastinal displacement as well. In this case of radiation fibrosis, we see a regional fibroconsolidative opacity in the medial left lung with associated ipsilateral pleural thickening along the postural lateral margin of the left lung. In this case of radiation fibrosis, there's a region of fibroconsolidation along the medial margin of the right lung, traction bronchiectasis within the fibroconsolidation, and distortion of the normal branching pattern of the airways. The fibrosis in the medial right lung has resulted in rightward displacement of the mediastinum as demonstrated by displacement of the tracheal bifurcation by a few centimeters right of midline. The radiation fibrosis in this case appears as a region of fibroconsolidation in the right lower lobe with local lung retraction, distortion, and traction bronchiectasis inside the opacity. Here's a coronal um, CT image of right upper lobe radiation fibrosis that's taken on a mass-like morphology. And here's a case of radiation fibrosis, which on the sagittal view exhibits a more linear or scar-like appearance. With regards to radiation, radiotherapy-related complications, we're looking out for severe cases of radiation pneumonitis or radiation fibrosis, and we're always carefully looking for any evidence of tumor recurrence. Tumor recurrence can be challenging to pick up on imaging because of the amount of fibrosis and distortion that may occur in the lung after radiotherapy. Most imaging features that arouse suspicion for tumor occurrence will be on chest CT rather than chest X-ray. Enlargement rather than progressive retraction of a radiation fibrosis opacity can be suspicious, 
as is when a new bulge occurs along the margin of the radiation fibrosis opacity. We carefully inspect not only the margins, but the interior of the radiation fibrosis opacity too, as tumor recurrence can sometimes manifest as an air bronchogram that becomes opacified or by new splaying of air bronchograms or vessels. Lung infection is another complication that can occur in patients post-radiotherapy. Lung infections are a little easier to pick up on imaging than local tumor recurrence and may present as fluffy lung opacities, particularly lung opacities that appear before radiotherapy has been completed or lung opacities that are distant from the radiotherapy site. The art of radiation therapy and expected imaging features following radiation therapy has and will continue to evolve as newer therapies emerge, um, such as proton beam therapy, which can treat lung cancer while exposing surrounding healthy tissue to significantly less radiation than SBRT or IMRT would. Instead of, X -ray, instead of X rays, protons that are stripped from hydrogen atoms in a particle accelerator like a cyclotron are directed and fired at a lung cancer from different angles using magnets. A couple of downsides do currently exist with proton beam therapy. Several weeks may be required to plan proton beam treatments, which may sometimes be too long a wait for some patients. Proton beam therapy is also currently available at only a very limited number of locations and may not always be covered by third-party insurers. That being said, proton beam therapy may be a promising option for previously irradiated lung cancers that need to be re-irradiated, and for lung cancers that abut particularly radiosensitive organs like the esophagus, heart, and spinal cord. This completes our review of surgical and radiotherapy approaches for treating lung cancer, expected post-procedure courses, potential complications, and relative imaging findings.